Now, why Nick Saban had to go and throw Jackson State name in all of this? We talk about why his words were so disrespectful to all HBCUs, but specifically Deion Sanders and Jackson State. Oh, yeah. This is Locked on HBCU. Play my music. <laughs> Locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU Podcast, your number one daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports Editor. Nick! Nick! Come on! Nick Saban said, what? For those who may not have heard, Nick Saban came out and had, I don't want to, I don't want to describe it as childish, but I am going to say he, he threw a fit about NILs in general, but he went to, to point out specific teams. He said, Texas A&M and Jackson State, right? Let's a little bit of background, however. Now, with NILs, it's essentially – the money that was being exchanged under the table, which we all are aware was happening, but we don't know specifically who it was happening with and all of those things. That's now in the light. So it's no more under the table deals. It's all about, yeah, you can pay players, but you're not supposed to be allowed to pay them to come to your school. That's the one rule, but you can pay players. It's okay. Now that it's not taboo to discuss, you're going to hear praise about, it. oh, finally the players are getting paid, but then you're also going to hear criticisms. With it being in the open and being able to actually talk about it freely, we have to understand that with the good is going to come the bad. And I'm not talking about just the impact. I'm talking about how people are going to discuss it. They're going to criticize it. Welcome to the NIL era. However, what Nick Saban did, in my opinion, crosses a line. We'll start off with what he said about Texas A&M. But you know this is locked on HBCU. So we're going to get into the disrespectful slander and defamation that he did. And, and you know what? Lies. We ain't giving no fancy. We're going to get into the lies that he told on Jackson State. But when it came to Texas A&M, he said Texas A&M bought their whole recruiting class. Bought them all. That's disrespectful already. Because you're basically saying you, you, you're you incapable of actually doing this. You have to buy them. I think it's disrespectful to the organization, the families, the player. I think it's disrespectful to a lot of people, right? But we're not going to get into here at least you can do it in the comments but here right now we're not going to get into the hypocrisy of let's not act like you know these things weren't happening before we're not going to get into that but he said that texas a&m bought their whole team and listen texas a&m out out recruited them i understand this is an overall nil deal but you know i i, I think this has to do a little something by sec now minus jack mine excuse me realize that jackson state is over there minding a swack business they not hurting nobody. They ain't got nothing to do with this. Absolutely nothing to do with this. And they just catch not even a stray. He directly shoots at Jackson State. It kind of feel like that 50 video where he like, what Floyd getting mad at me for? He did that. He did that. Texas ain't them the one that out recruited you. Jackson State ain't causing you no harm. So why even speak up on that? It's just a disdain for NILs, but it felt so unnecessary to actually do. Another reason this felt weird to me, and it wasn't just the conference and all of that stuff. It's the fact that Deion Sanders and Nick Saban seem to have a decent relationship. And we'll get into that when it came to the responses that Deion Sanders and Jimbo Fisher, you know, gave out. But they seem to have a decent relationship. They had these Aflac commercials together, and that doesn't mean they're friends. But I know that Deion Sanders respects Coach Saban. I know that. He said, listen, when he was talking to that reporter, he said, address me the way you would address Saban. Call me coach. He used him as the standard. So you know how he feels about him. But this move right here, I'm not going to say that Saban didn't res doesn't respect Sanders. 
but this move was disrespectful. The words that he said was disrespectful. And I'm just confused. It was Jackson State and Florida State for Travis Hunter. This is not even an SEC team that we're talking about. We're talking about an, an ACC team. Do I need to call up Candace Cooper? I've been waiting for a reason. I've been waiting for a reason to get on the show. Do I need to call her up? Like, this had nothing to do. I wasn't on there talking with Chris Gordy about this. I was on there with Candace Cooper and Max Moody. That's who I was talking to about this move. So this came all the way out of left field. But what was the responses like? How did we retaliate? Now, Jackson State's head coach Candace has something I thought was funny. We, if we're talking about the initial reaction, and I laughed. I'm not gonna say I laugh, lie to you. I laughed because he came. He said, "This is the tweet that he put out there." You best believe I will address that lie that Coach Saban told tomorrow. I was and awakened by my son, Shadur Sanders, that sent me an article stating that we paid Travis Hunter a million to play for Jackson State. We as a people do not have to pay our people to play with our people. I laughed because this tweet was sent out at 11 o'clock and I personally am a night, a night out. So the idea of somebody waking you up at 11 o'clock is funny to me. You know? I understand it's probably not funny to you. But to me, this is funny. And I knew he wasn't lying because he had this weird and symbol in there. That was an absolute typo. And I feel like Deion Sanders would have proofread this if he was like really awake. No, I really think he was woken up and was probably upset about it. But you see, he said after all this happened in the morning, he did respond. He said, basically, you're projecting. You would have done wrong. So you're saying I did wrong. I didn't. Let's mind you, this was a lie. There was no payment of a million dollars that text that uh Jackson State bragged about. Then he later on says, I still love him. I still admire him. I respect him. He's the magnum cum laude of college football. So, I mean, he's playing nice. He's playing nice. But we know what it is. It's disrespect. It's disrespect. And it should not be tolerated. Right? You, you look at that and you say, how did Jimbo Fisher respond? Jimbo Fisher ripped him a new one. Jimbo Fisher was not playing with Nick Saban, and they probably have a close relationship. They worked together for years, for years, and Jimbo Fisher let him have it. He even kind of hedged on releasing information, not releasing information, but like basically if you go ask somebody, you can find some stuff out that Nick's not going to want to be asked, out, asked about. You can. Now, of course, the most important piece in this for the Jackson State side, Travis Hunter. Travis Hunter said, I ain't get a million. If I got a, how I get a million and my mom is still living in a three bedroom house with five kids. Mind you, there's no re, there's no reason to hide this. There's no reason to act like it didn't happen. Those are the responses. Right. And I think that Nick Saban can have his issue with NILs all he wants. But the first mistake that he made was singling out teams. He should have never specifically pointed out Texas A&M and Jackson State. He realized that and he said he was wrong for that. I do give him credit for that. But the second mistake that he made was lying. He got up there and he told a bold-faced lie about the NIL deal between State and Travis Hunter. We're going to talk about infuriated me the most about this whole situation. But before we get into that, we're going to discuss Built Bar because they are the best protein bar on the market. And listen, they sent me a pack and I opened it up. I think birthday cake might have just... Oh, I almost got real corny with that one, right? <laughs> I think birthday cake might have just taken... First place, I, I recency bias. I gotta try a built bar, um, blueberry muffin, and then a built puff birthday cake. But this thing was absolutely phenomenal. They sent me. I don't know how long that pack is going to last. Locked on. I, I need another one. It was that delicious, and it still gave me 17 grams of protein. Delicious and healthy for you. It's a perfect combination. Only four grams of sugar, four net carbs. Delicious flavors. So chewy. Tastes like it's protein infused marshmallow. These things were amazing. Go to built.com and use the promo code LOCKED15. When you do it, tell me I'm lying. We keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day every day. I do appreciate it for real. Making us a part of your daily routine. Thank you. Now, make sure that you're checking out Locked on NBA Big Boards because Rafael Barlow, host of the NBA Draft Junkies and author of the NBA Big Boards newsletter, is going to be on there with Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, Leaf Thulin, breaking down the NBA Draft mock drafts and of course big boards now you can get that wherever you get your podcast i want to give you the word of the day it's kai bosh referring to something that serves as a check or a and is usually used in the phrase bosh on 
I take a lot of offense to what Nick Saban said. I think it's very dangerous, and I think it's very disrespectful. I'll start off with the dangerous part. See, I understand where Nick Saban is coming from. It's a place of confusion. He sits here and says, I'm Nick Saban. NIL, no NIL, does not matter. I am getting these players. Texas A&M, you're not doing that. Jackson State, you're not doing that. That's what he says in his mind. I get it. He's confused on how Texas A&M could have the number one recruiting class above him. He's confused on how Travis Hunter could want to go to Jackson State. So what is the next and easiest thing to jump to? Money. That's what. That's the easiest thing to find. Oh, they got paid. He, he went there because they got paid or because he got paid. They went there because they got paid. That's it. Now it's done. I ain't got nothing to stress no more. Oh, sh- well, y- y'all paid them players. That's why they got here. Now to go out there and say it, wild. Actually thinking it, okay, whatever. There's going to be a lot of people who think it. There's going to be people watching this right now who think it. But going out there and saying it, when you're Nick Saban, wild. And my problem is Nick Saban speaks as if his word is fact. Oh, we about to put the kibosh on that notion because it isn't. It isn't. And here's the problem. Whether you feel like Jackson State paid Travis Hunter or not, you're not about to go up there and be Nick Saban and utter a bold-faced lie and say that it was in the paper and they bragged about it. I've never seen that. I haven't. I have repeatedly seen them seen them dismiss the notion that they paid Travis Hunter. So you got to show me where they bragged about it. See, here's my thing. I, I don't really care if Travis Hunter got paid or not. But I do feel like it would fly in the face of what they are trying to pitch right now. What the the narrative is, is that Travis Hunter wanted to go to to an HBCU. I don't doubt it, especially the one that's coached by Deion Sanders. Saying that that money happened or that money was exchanged as if it was the deciding factor. Because let's be very clear. And I'm going to jump to it. I I don't know if I was going to jump into it, but I'm going to jump to it right now. You just said. HBCUs can't get a player of that caliber. That's what you just said. Not not verbatim. I'm not paraphrasing. I'm not quoting. I am coming to my own conclusion. But when you say somebody was bought, that's disrespectful. Now, money can exchange, whatever. That's in, it's NILs now. You can do that. But to say you bought that player is as if you stand no chance if you don't dish out that money. I rebuke that. He's disrespectful to all HBCUs. Let's get into what he actually said. Let's get into that. And what he actually said was, we have a rule right now that says you can't use NIL to entice a player to come to your school. Jackson State paid a guy a million dollars last year who was a really good Division I player to come to a school. It was in the paper and they bragged about it. That didn't happen. They didn't brag about it, right? You want to feel like they put out that number or whatever. They've repeatedly dismissed this million-dollar barstool NIL that people talked about at the very beginning. They dismissed that. They've never bragged about it they don't even say it happened right let's be very clear they came out and denounced it again so they obviously do not either do not want to publicize it or it did not happen i don't know why it's so hard for people to believe that it didn't happen but let's get into that one sentence right here jackson state paid a a guy a million dollars last year who was a really good division one player to come to a school in other words he said ain't no way Ain't no way a top player in the nation would want to go to an HBCU. In this, honestly, two years ago, three years ago, I I might even agree with him. I'm going to tell you the truth. This momentum in the idea that HBCUs were significantly less than and not really a good option was still prevailing. But right now in the climate that we're in, the view of HBCUs in multiple people, I'm not going to say everybody, but in multiple people is significantly different than it was Even two years ago, we have to acknowledge that the climate is changing with NILs, but the climate is changing around HBCU. It would not shock me at all. So with that being said, this is disrespectful to every single HBCU. Travis Hunter went to Jackson State, but he really is saying ain't no player of that caliber going to a school of that caliber. Now let's get into why this is disrespectful to Deion Sanders. This is disrespectful. Deion Sanders because we're sitting here acting like he's not one of the most charismatic people in football. I'm not talking college football. I'm not talking pro football. I'm talking about anybody you know in football that the world knows. Deion Sanders is among that list of most charismatic people out there. His mouthpiece 
is gold. The idea that he could not convince a player to come here, I think is silly. But if you add context, it becomes even more silly. Travis Hunter idolizes Deion Sanders. I even heard that he wanted to go to Florida State because Deion Sanders went to Florida State. You trying to tell me that if a kid wants to go to his idol's alma mater, the, the idol can't get him to want to come to the school he coaches at right now? Let's hear that again. Travis Hunter had some interest in Florida State because he loved Deion Sanders so much that he wanted to go to the same school, contribute to that DBU legacy that Florida State tries to be a part of. But you telling me he can think all of that, but he can't actually want to be coached by his idol, Deion Sanders. You see how that don't really make sense? That's not really logical to me. I don't understand why it's so hard to fight. If he got paid, he got paid, whatever. But the idea that he had to get paid, I rebuke that. I do. And honestly, I'm tired. I'm tired. So I'm not going to sit here and argue it anymore. I got my boy Joey Ikes. He's coming in. He's the host of Locked On Texas A&M. The guy just got introduced to the Locked On family like yesterday, maybe two days ago. Hasn't even been able to put a podcast out yet. And they dropped this bombshell on him about Texas A&M. So I'm tagging in my partner. I need somebody else to slander the Nick Saban name and what he really just did. Not even a name. Cool. But what he did, yeah, this needs to be called out. But before I get into that and take my break, let me tell you about Bet Online because BetOnline.net is the best place for all of your wagering needs. As the NBA playoffs continue going, we're going to have game twos, game threes during the weekend. And what's going on? Is Golden State going to continue the domination from game one? Is Dallas going to bounce back? We saw that a clip on that from Locked On Mavs talking about, hey, Dallas has been in this position before, but you're going to have to fight a little, more, a little bit more because Golden State is not going to collapse. Go get the odds on that. And if that's not your, not your thing, you can do NFL futures. You can do MLB, MMA, poker. Does not matter. You can do everything at Bet Online. That's why they are the fastest and easiest. Way to wage on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked On HBCU, I can't continue. I got to tag in my partner, Joey Ikes, Locked On Texas A&M host, to discuss Nick Saban's intentions. What was his motivation behind these statements? And then also, what's the difference between how Deion Sanders answered and how Jimbo Fisher fired back? Because it was completely different. I'm going to let him take over while I give me a little bit of rest. All right, Joey, let me be the first one to introduce you, or welcome you, I should say, to the Locked On Network, you know, host of Locked On Texas A&M. We could be happy to have you as part of the family, and we're going to be teaming up about Nick Saban because I don't know what. This feels like a get-off-of-my-lawn type of moment, a guy who is struggling to adapt to the changes in how college football is operating. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And, and if you listen to all of his comments, it was – that was very evident. He, you know, there was a lot of, you know, well, we saw name, image, and likeness as this thing that create and you know, trying to create this this atmosphere that that he's somehow holier than thou about the way that he handled the implementation of NIL in college football. And we wanted to make we were gonna have a collective, but we were gonna make sure that each player in our locker room got the same opportunity through that collective, but that each player had the chance to go create as much opportunity for themselves as possible. And that's how we were going to keep it equal within our locker room is that the guys who got more had earned more in some way. And so it definitely was a, I'm, I'm holier than now. I have some sort of moral high ground and I am, uh, you know, I get off my lawn about this, like go away. And, and he has a, he has a little bit of a reputation of doing this with new things that come about. And so, you know, I'm not all that surprised that he's mad about it because he didn't win at something, right? He's been winning at everything for 20 years, it feels like. And he, he got beat in recruiting this year and uh, pretty handily, and he didn't like it too much. Yeah, and I think that not losing is something that's common. We saw him lose to Georgia. He lost to Kirby. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, was the first he ever lost to one of his former assistants. And now you're coming into the offseason recruiting and a former assistant of his beat him out in recruiting 
how much of this you th that used to be he was under me and now he just beat yeah. me in something yeah and I, I think it doesn't help that you know a and m beat him on the field last year and then turns around he loses to georgia in the national championship game and then in the first recruiting class where where name image and likeness was really a, a big deal uh he gets beat there too and he he also understands that you know there's articles out there that give the valuations of football programs and show their profits and things like that. He knows A&M turns something like $30 million a year more in profit through the football program than Alabama does. And so he knows that despite all of the winning that they've done, despite everything that he's done, that if A&M boosters redirect that money towards NIL instead of investing it in the program itself, that – he's going to get blown out of the water in terms of what he can do from an NIL standpoint and that he's going to get washed out. And he doesn't like that idea very much. And he's, uh, he's going to throw a fit about it on his way down at least. You know, I completely forgot A&M knocked off Bama this year. Kirby smart doing it with Georgia, yeah. but I forgot that Jimbo did it as well. That definitely adds a layer to the onion. That is this robbery, the NIL bowl that people are calling it. I, <laughs> I love it and right now. Deion Sanders, who was also mentioned in Travis Hunter, right? We talked about that in our first two segments here, but he was mentioned and his response was a little bit different than Jimbo. Deion went the strictly Twitter route, at least right now when we're recording. If something else has happened, it happened after we were recording. I promise y'all. But there was two different approaches. How do you look at them both? Yeah, I think Jimbo has never uh, never shied away from an opportunity to get in front of a microphone and tell people how he feels. And right. uh, and he was pretty fired up, probably in a very similar way to the way Dion was. And whenever, you know, these guys build these relationships with these players and, you know, whether there's NIL money associated with it or not, like these guys still walk into these parents, fam these families' houses and, and you know, give their sales pitch and, and, and commit to taking care of these players. And when some guy comes in from left field and takes a shot that they interpret it as like, hey, man, this is a shot at me. It's a shot at my players and at their families like they're not going to take kindly to it. And Jim, Jimbo's style is to get in front of a microphone and, and really let people have it when he needs to. And so he, he did that today. And uh, I know certainly from from an A&M fan perspective and the players, everybody so far has absolutely loved the way that Jimbo responded. And, and it basically it did two things that showed it, Nick Saban broadcasted that a and is an extremely rich football program with a lot of money behind it. And that Jimbo will go to the mats for you if he needs to. And he's not scared of anybody, uh, even all the way up to, you know, Nick Saban, the best football coach in college football history. So uh, I, I think the two styles are a little different, uh, but but that's definitely Jimbo style to get in front of a microphone. And he's got, you know, that the old Southern draw that just sort of gets rolling and keeps going. And he, he'll get after you with it for sure. Yeah, Jimbo was heated. Jimbo was ab yeah. absolutely heated. I expect on to have a a similar you know take but he did a tweet he might do a press conference but i want to ask one last question before we get out of here and that is do you think there's going to be any impact as far as how people view and i based off of saban's comments because saban is still saban and you might be with locked on a and m i'm with locked on hbcu we have different perspectives but the general fan with no allegiances might say that's saban so what's going to be the impact from his comments yeah, that's a great question. You know, and I, I maybe being all caught up in all the uh, the hullabaloo today, I don't know that I've given that a whole lot of thought about sort of what comes from this from a from a bigger picture fan standpoint and, and sort of media thought about the deal. But I think I think the NIL was sort of the NCAA's way of saying, hey, you know what, you guys do whatever it is that you want to do as long as it doesn't come directly through the football program itself. Like we're sort of stepping back. We're not going to regulate it too much. We can't enforce our regulations anyway, even if we did write them. Um, so I, it may create a little bit of a taboo of the idea that 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 players are making some of these decisions based on NIL money. But the other side of that coin is, is Shannon Sharp said it today on, on TV. and uh, uh, He was talking about the situation with, with Dion and with Jackson State and everything. And, and he talked about how he grew up and how if he had had the opportunity to choose a college based on some money and be able to tell his grandma, like, hey, we're getting out of this place where we've been and we're going here and things are going to be better here when he's 17 or 18 years old. He absolutely would have done it. 
without a without a hesitation. And I think that's the part of this that sort of gets overlooked a little bit is that the whole root of the NIL deal was to allow these football players and these these other athletes too from other sports, but you know, football's the the revenue sport. It's the money maker. Uh, to allow these guys to to better their lives and better their families' lives. Yeah. utilizing their talents and abilities on the football field to do that and to allow them to make some profit too. And not just the, not just the football programs and the head coaches and, and the, the folks associated with it. So um, that's an important part that I think we all need to remember in that, you know, some of these older, some of these older, and I'll just say it, some of these older white guys that are these head football coaches that have been taking advantage of this system for, for decades and decades, um, they're going to resist it because that's human nature is to resist change, especially when it has a chance to affect you negatively. Um, but it's not going away. And he, and Saban even said that in the, um, in this, in his comments, he's like, this stuff is here and it's not going away. He's like, I don't know how sustainable it is to do it this way, but there are some people who are going to try. And, uh, and so even he, as, as Nick Saban understands that it's here and it's here to stay and that, on certain circumstances, it can be good for the kids. I think he just understands that it's going to make things harder for him, and he knows he's going to lose some recruits because of it. Well, Joey, I appreciate you coming on. I can't wait until Locked On Texas A&M gets going. We will definitely be checking that out. And if we ever need to tag up and, and take down Nick Saban, I know exactly who I'm going to call. This is Joey Ike. Make sure that you are watching out for him when Texas A&M or Locked On Texas A&M does drop. Shout out to Joey Ikes for coming on the show and talking about this saving scandal. He hasn't even had an opportunity to have his first episode yet, and he's already booked and busy with this mess. Now, I appreciate all of you for making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day because Saban gave us some phenomenal Feature Friday content to discuss. At least it's that. Now, on Monday's episode, I think we'll finally be able to get to that Tennessee State transfer that we were supposed to talk about today. Now, for your second listen of the day, make sure that you're checking out Locked On SEC. Chris Gordy is going to have everything that you need for this scandal that we talked about today because it's going to have rippling effects throughout the rest of the conference as well. Now, in the meantime, in between time, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other, family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.